Thanks for joining the Rethink and Retool podcast with Mayhul Mankad, MD, where we take a look at the people side of healthcare and new ideas about enhancing overall well being. So, welcome. The doctor is in the house. Welcome to Rethink and Retool, sponsored by Alliance Health. This is Mayhul Mankad, psychiatrist and chief medical officer for Alliance. You know, something we've all learned in the past few years is that the emergency room is not the only place or even the best place for people who are suffering from a mental health crisis to find support. When folks are not yet engaged in mental health care or if they can't reach their mental health provider between visits, where can they turn? Today, I'm fortunate to get the opportunity to speak with Dr. Chuck Browning, Chief Medical Officer of RI International. From crisis phone calls to crisis facilities, nobody knows this stuff better than Dr. Chuck. Dr. Chuck Browning. Hey, well. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. I, you know, I wish these were uh, face to face because I feel like, you know, now that people are, are out and about, uh, it would be nice to, to record in person, but uh, we, will, we will do the best we can virtually. Um, but uh, very much appreciate you joining us today. You know, I was thinking as I was uh, preparing for our time together that I would share a little story with you, and then you tell me uh, how things are different these days. So as my teenage daughter likes to say, I was uh, trained in the last century, uh, and so I did, I did a fair amount of my medical and psychiatric training in the nineties. And at that time, if somebody had a crisis, whether it was a behavioral health crisis or a physical one, there was, uh, essentially two things they could do. They could call their doctor's office if they had a doctor and try to get some help after hours. And if that didn't pan out, which it often didn't, their only option was to go to the emergency room. Now, I, my understanding is times have changed a lot. Um, and so what would it be like for somebody these days? That's a great question. And I'm gonna give you a couple of different answers. Uh, one of them is that unfortunately across our country, um, and I, I do this a lot talking about crisis systems, consulting with multiple different uh, country, uh, countries and states around our country in looking at crisis care. And unfortunately, right now in so many parts of our country, that's still the go-to option. It's to call 911 or go to the emergency room. Um, unfortunately, that is still the place that we're in. But the good news is there is a lot of development of a better uh, system for emergency psychiatric and substance use, substance use um, supports being developed and working really well and showing both good outcomes in a business case and a clinical case in different states. And there's more momentum hold than there's ever been before uh, coming through the pandemic and different movements related to social just justice and the involvement of mental health and law enforcement in the community that has produced this momentous occasion that we've never had before to really push forward a change in our emergency medical system for behavioral health. And so that's wow. really so, exciting. Um, I, so I'm, yeah, I'm excited to hear about that as well. And, and I, I'd love for you to unpack some of that. You shared a lot with us. And so you kind of described it as a system rather than kind of a one-stop shop being the ER. What, what do you mean by a system for crisis? Well, the best way for me to describe it, and hopefully in a short term that makes sense for the listeners, is to compare about the system that we have if you had chest pain. You know, you okay. can call 911, and if okay. the 911 caller sees certain things that you can handle safely at, at, at your home, then, then they'll help you do that. But if you need someone to come to you, then they activate with GPS technology and things like that, a paramedic or EMS to come to you. And then they have equipment and infrastructure to assess you on site. And if you're stable based on like your EKG there and the, the parameters of what's going on, they may let you, you know, help you stay in the community and connect with follow up. But if you need more, 
then you can go to the emergency department. And once you get to the emergency department, there are standards of care based on, you know, years and years of studying how this is done across the country. And the beauty of this system is that uh, it doesn't matter whether you're insured or not insured, what your race or age or uh, demographics are, that you're going to get access to care that's pretty standard across the whole country. And we don't have that for mental health and substance use. The other piece is that we those three pillars are there in our emergency medical system. But also, if you have chest pain, if you go to the hospital, you don't just either go home or go to the ICU and have um, you know, a full on cardiac operation. There's lots of layers of continuum in between that are offered to you based on what your needs are. You might have a step down unit. You might go to an outpatient rehab. There might be a more cardiac intensive care unit. You might directly go to a stent if you need that level. So, I mean, there's so many different pieces that are there and they're all driven on data and studies, what works and what doesn't work. And it's kind of publicized and people follow that. And so we're decades behind that in behavioral health in emergency response systems, but there are states where we're seeing that level of change occurring. And then nationally, there's really cool movement called 988, which is the installation of a number that's the equivalent of 911 for emergency behavioral health calls. That's gonna be implemented nationwide in July of 2022. And as that unfolds and moves forward, there's gonna be growing pains as there was when they activated 911 but it offers finally a really op a real big opportunity to create a system where somebody can call and get specific supports for behavioral health crisis. And then if they need an ex another layer of care, having mobile support teams that can come out anywhere in the community and see people and hopefully destabilize, uh, excuse me, no, not destabilize, de-escalate whatever they need and stabilize and then be able to stay in the community. And then if they need help, then there are places that people can go to that are specifically designed to handle emergency medical care. And, and at RI, as the chief medical officer there, that's what we specialize in is that crisis receiving center uh, in North Carolina. Some people call it facility based crisis. Wow. So that what you're describing to me is this brave new world that uh, some parts of the U.S. have already adopted and then other parts of the U.S. I'm hoping are, are looking at where uh, right now uh, someone might call 911 and, and at some point it'll be 988. And then there will be kind of layers and nuance in terms of what is available and what the outcome will be and not just this one dimensional model of law enforcement sometimes picking people up and then dropping them off uh, in an emergency room. Um, so you had mentioned mobile crisis. You had mentioned um, facility-based crisis. Uh, I've, I've also heard of something called behavioral health urgent care. Um, could you tell us yes. a little bit about these, these kind of these different levels that you're talking about? Sure. Sure. So the principal pillars, if you look at SAMHSA's uh, national toolkit, uh, for crisis care are that you do have the basics of the equality and parity to emergency medical services. So a crisis call line, and that would be 988, that you would have um, mobile support teams, which is the equivalent of EMS and paramedics, and then crisis receiving centers, which are the equivalent to an ED, uh, but specialized in those things. Then uh, having a certain level of essential crisis care principles that layer into that. So safer zero suicide or zero suicide principles, use heavy significant use of peer support, um, recovery oriented principles and trauma informed care principles that are built into that. Having coordination with law enforcement and emergency medical services in all of those three lanes. And then uh, being able to maintain safety for the guests and the staff, because that's a big deal during crisis situations for some um, certain psychiatric and substance use situation, situations that come up. However, when you look at the whole continuum of the whole, just like in medical care, it's important to have other layers to so that if you have those basic pillars in an ideal system, you would continue to have other layers. So behavior health urgent care would be like going to an urgent care for medical things instead of going to the emergency room. So if you're have, you know, strep throat and you don't want to go to the emergency room and you don't have a primary care that can get you in, you can go to a minute clinic, have that test done and find out yes or no and get a prescription for antibiotics. And that's been shown to kind of fit the model that many people like that to get served in that way. And so there are definitely situations where people have run out of their medications, but they're not having an intense crisis that they would need to be 
you know, definitely in a hospitalized or things like that. And so uh, there's lots of situations where having layers like that are great. Um, having different ranges of care for different levels of substance use severity, um, intensive outpatient programs, MAT programs and things like that offer lots of routines and, and alternatives. And the other thing that often gets missed in crisis is how much social determinants play a part in people's presentation and needs. Um, so housing issues, um, you know, food, uh, being able to obtain access to medication, transportation, different things like that can have big impacts on folks that we see oftentimes come to our crisis centers over and over again. And it's not just about finding the right medication or um, having a follow-up appointment. There's, there's things in their life that are basic needs that are driving a huge amount of stress or things that are going on. Wow. So um, one of the things you had mentioned that I don't automatically think about when I think about crisis is an orientation towards uh, long-term recovery and not just the crisis that's right in your face. And I, I'd love for us to come back after the break and hear some more thoughts about that, because that's really a different way of thinking about crisis than I think a lot of people do. Um, so uh, I do want to warn people, though, when we do come back from the break, uh, Dr. Chuck's going to share one of his guilty pleasures. We will be Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> At Alliance, we see healthcare differently than some. Every day, we walk alongside the people we serve on their chosen path to recovery and self determination. We believe in healthcare that concentrates on the whole person, including support that promotes physical, social, emotional, and financial well being, and housing security. Helping people live healthier, more satisfying lives that's the Alliance way. All right, Dr. Chuck, you ready to tell us what is that thing that um, people don't know about you that they might be interested oh in? Oh my goodness, <laughs> I can't believe I'm admitting this. I'm a very lackluster lead singer of a garage band of folks that are much more talented than me uh, in the band in my neighborhood. Um, we play up in the attic and call ourselves three floors up. And we do, we do play gigs for people in our neighborhood who are willing to put up with listening to us. <laughs> Um, every once in a while. Um, and we sing a variety of like 70s, 80s, 90s, sometimes a couple of current songs that the, uh, but even kids in our neighborhood that are of those families will come and participate sometimes. Oh, that's awesome. So it's fun. It gives us something to do um, some nights uh, together to practice and keep together and a lot of camaraderie. And we try to engage other people in the neighborhood to play like the tambourine or we had a lady play a flute for one of the songs. It was great. That's awesome. So, so three floors up. So tell me something that's on your set list for three floors up. Oh my goodness. Some of it would definitely be what your uh, daughter was accusing you of <laughs> during your times in the nineties. Uh, we, we tend to do really well with certain alt rock songs like in red hot chili peppers uh, and okay. audio slave and some of those type groups, Foo fighters, that stuff. But we do a variety, a lot of different things. That's awesome. That's awesome. I did not know that about you. And uh, just, you know, you've got to, you've got your own layers uh, like an onion. You'll never see it in public if I can help <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yeah, we may have to book uh, Three Floors Up for like the Psychiatry <laughs> Association meeting or something. <laughs> no way. I'm going to be all day long. That, maybe not. Um, so, so coming back to our, our topic, you were mentioning that uh, one of the approaches that you're fond of with working with individuals in crisis is a recovery orientation. I think I know what that means, but could you help unpack that and just kind of lay it all out there uh, as to what a recovery orientation is? And how would that be relevant to crisis? Because I got to tell you, when, when I've taken care of people in crisis in like an emergency room setting, it's really just about what can we do for you in the next hour, not anything beyond that. That's such a great question, Mahul. I, it's, it's one of the reasons I love working at RI, which stands for, you know, the, the former name was Recovery Innovations. And it originally was started by a group of folks decades ago who were out in Arizona who were extremely interested in the involvement and use of peer support in this crisis care continuum and spectrum. 
And so I have been so fortunate over the years of working with RI to really be able to have the experience of seeing the power of what these recovery oriented approaches bring to crisis care, um, as well as a person's longer term uh, work as well. And we, we talk about what we call peer powered practices as part one of our keys at RI and the RI way of what we do. And we label those in certain approaches and they're very uh, big parts of recovery oriented care. And by the way, when you look at SAMHSA's national toolkit for all layers of care, whether it's crisis call line or mobile support or crisis receiving centers, it is a recovery oriented approach. And so um, our peer power practices include um, strengths based, which means focusing on what people's strengths are instead of their weakness in their crisis. It involves looking at the whole person's health. So it's not just about their illness and their diagnosis, which as a psychiatrist, we get trained to do that all the time. It's also about looking at what is matters to them in their life, their meaning and their purpose, their family and connections and support systems and where they are. So it's really about not just focusing on this person has schizophrenia or this person has depression. It's looking at what is going on in your life that brought you to this crisis and um, what 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 are the meaningful things in the big picture that you can control that we can help empower you and support you to work on that. And you just would be amazed at how often that is such a huge part in a crisis situation of helping someone improve quick, quicker and uh, having more feelings of hope about their situation by being able to connect into these humanistic things. Um, and I, I really believe and I, I'm participating with things that we're doing at RI and studying this is when you when people come into a crisis situation and they feel cared for by the team that that has an impact in your crisis improvement that just this concept of feeling cared for it's been studied in the hospital systems a lot as to what creates success and that's usually the number one measurement uh that that guests or patients talk about is do i feel cared for that's the number it's not hospital food might be a complaint but what really matters is do i feel cared for and so um, that's such an important piece that we try to instill in um, all of our staff, but it's not easy to do because there's so many different staff members. Crisis work is really hard. You see people going through really tough times who might on their worst day be really irritable or angry about situations. Uh, they can be violent even. So it can be scary to work in that environment if you're not feeling trained and having the tools and the resources to do it. And so um, it, it takes a lot of work and infrastructure to have that kind of customer service angle where you can do that. Um, having peers as part of our treatment team is a and giving them voice and value in the whole treatment team also makes a big impact, I think, Mahul, in creating that recovery approach. Because I can't tell you how many times I've had a peer support person work with someone who's I've walked in your shoes. I've been where you've been and here's where I am now. And it just creates this lane of engagement that makes it so much easier. And then for them to say, hey, you can trust talking to Dr. Chuck. He is going to listen to you. He cares about you getting better and working on this thing. So tell him what you told me. Tell him what he really feels about it. And it, it just opens up this lane of engagement that oftentimes you don't get because of past context that people bring into their situation. And that's that trauma-informed care piece, which is another one of our peer power practices, is spending time from a recovery perspective, trying to understand what people are going through and instead of it, how it's impacting you as a staff member working in crisis, thinking about what they're bringing to you in your situation, understanding that and have an empathy so that then you have a better chance of engaging with them and helping partner with them in a collaborative way. And that's that's our uh, fourth peer power practice is collaboration. So when you partner with people, they take stake in what they're doing. And so many times in hospital settings, you're a piece of the puzzle of getting processed. And so we really talk about um, we want to partner, not process, do with and not do to. And it's really easy in crisis to not do that uh, because you're time pressured. There's parameters of business rules and things like that. And they're all together in this ball of tension that you have to pull out. But when you take the time to do that, you usually end up getting much better outcomes and much better customer service experience. The idea of using peers and including people with authentic lived experience has been around in mental health for a while. I just, I am so impressed that you, you're passionate about introducing it from the moment that people uh, hit the door with the mental health crisis. It is, we call it peer first, peer last. Uh -huh. That you see someone first and last. 
And so our peers are not prescribing medications. They're not making diagnoses. They're um, not doing certain licensed clinical roles, but they're, we're, they're indispensable in what they do for the milieu, for our teams, for helping the rest of our staff use peer powered practices as well, not just the peers. Um, it, it makes a big impact. So I think in my experience doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think I know the answer to this question, um, Dr. Chuck, but I'm, I'm going to ask it. What gets you out of the bed in the morning? Why do you do what you do? Cause you have options. You are a doctor. You can do all kinds of other stuff. Why do you do this? That's a great question. Um, and that calls that calls for some self analysis. I did that <laughs> during residency training in my therapy. I got to go go deep. Um, no, I mean really just basic human things of uh, having significance. So being able to be a part of a movement that potentially is changing the country's way of how we support a group that for so long has been disenfranchised, marginalized, um, not treated equally, and having a lot of stigma. Um, and especially when you look at uh, minorities and minority populations and how they get treated in crisis situations compared to the other demographics. Um, it's an, it's a chance to have a big impact on the way our system uh, operates. And so that's one thing. The second thing is like I described is just when I started working over 10 years ago with RI and being a part of what they do with this recovery oriented approach and this peer care and seeing how it works. And then Larry, on top of it, seeing that we had an option in North Carolina in the areas where we're operating for people not to be handcuffed to a gurney in an emergency room for five days, waiting to go to an inpatient stay for seven days. That's three hours away, away from their family and supports and those types of things. And, and having people and friends call me and say, I need some help uh, with the suicidal thoughts, but I am not going to an emergency room. They will lock me up and I'm not, it's not going to happen. And being able to see people have a better experience, uh, that's meaningful. And so it's uh, it's really cool to be a part of it on a day by day level here in North Carolina, but also on a national and international movement level. Well, Dr. Chuck Browning, uh, thank you for doing what you do and for being our guest. We appreciate it. I'm a whole so much fun. Thank you. The Rethink and Retool Healthcare in the New Era podcast is produced by Alliance Health, a North Carolina public managed care organization. The show is produced by Brandon Alexander. Our associate producer is Denise Dirks and executive producer is Doug Fuller. View our show notes and hear other episodes at alliancehealthplan.org forward slash podcast. Thanks for tuning in.